and that approach seems to be a very good one to trying to get your head around um, these false positive results. I mean, we're hearing that a lot about that at the moment. You know, if, if I get a PCR test and it's negative, but I had a lateral flow that's positive, what's the probability that I might actually have COVID? But I mean, there's a kind of classic one, and, and maybe yeah. people can have a think about this problem and, and see what you think the answer is. And um, so, half of the uh, one percent of the population uh, of women will have breast cancer when they come in for a scan. Ninety percent of them uh, with cancer will get a positive result but 9% of those without cancer will also get a positive result. So if you get a positive result, what's the probability that you have breast cancer? Now, as you say in the book, a lot of doctors get this wrong, and they, they say, oh, it's probably, you know, probably about 80, 90%, um, but it's incredibly low, because... It, it, it's closer it's, to 9%, it, yeah. It's closer to 9%, and you think, well, that's crazy, you know. Uh, um, but your sort of argument about thinking about the hundred lenders um, is kind of the way to kind of sort this problem out for people, rather than, you know, 90% uh, of people. I think percentages people find very difficult, but if you say a thousand people uh, come in and, okay, how many will have cancer uh, of those? Well, only 10 will have, and nine will have a positive result. Um, but there will be 990 people without, and 89 will get a positive result. So I think that, that's a very... Yes, and, and it's, 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 the studies have been done by uh, Gerd Gigerenzer, the German psychologist, and by Lita Cosmides and John Tooby. And the, the kinds of problems, these are problems in Bayesian reasoning, named after the Reverend Thomas Bayes, which sounds scarier than it is, Bayes' theorem, but it has become a, uh, almost an obsession now within cognitive psychology, uh, both as a source of models and as a model of what what people do when they make uh, uncertain judgments. And Bayesian reasoning is simply how, what is the, the, the optimal way to calibrate your degree of credence in a hypothesis? Let's say you're, how certain you feel is on a scale from zero to one, and you've got some evidence. The evidence is never perfectly dispositive. There are always false negatives, false positives. So how should you bump up or, or nudge down your uh, degree of confidence in an idea depending on the strength of evidence. And there's a simple equation, Bayes' rule, it's just got three terms. Some of it has escaped into everyday conversation in the term priors, like my priors for this, uh, what are your priors? That is a kind of leaked out from Bayes' theorem into everyday conversation, I think just in the last 10 or 15 years. But the Bayes', Bayes rule gives you the answer to the medical diagnosis problem. Namely, you multiply the base rate, that's the, uh, say, one in a hundred, by the likelihood, and that's the sensitivity of the test. If the hypothesis is true, what is the probability that you would see the evidence that you're seeing, divided by the prevalence of the evidence? How often do you get a, a test result, say a positive test result, averaging across people who are healthy and sick, the true positives and the false positives? So they're just th three numbers that give you the, the answer. It comes out very different from people's intuitions. Namely, Bayes' theorem says in, in the medical diagnosis problem, the chance that you have the disease with a positive test result is 9%. A sample of doctors say it's 90%. And uh, Kahneman and Tversky's explanation is that we're victims of uh, a fallacy they call base rate neglect. Namely, what we don't take into account, and the reason that our intuitions go so awry, is that very first thing that you say when you introduce the problem, namely 1% of, say in this case, women have breast cancer in the, in the population, the base rate, which gives you the prior, one of the three terms in the equation. Uh, people's heads are turned by the test result, the sensitivity of the test. Well, the test is 90% you know, accurate. That means if you get a positive result, then there's a 90% chance that you've got the disease, right? And that's the way, what it's natural to think, that's the way doctors think, that's an incorrect way of thinking because it doesn't take into account the rarity of the disease in the population to begin with, with the implication that most of the positives will be false positives. And one way to think your way out of this dilemma is to just start off with by counting the positives. How, uh, of all the people who test positive, 
how many of those are false positive, how many of them are true positive, and then the answer is likely to pop out. And um, again, as with the Linda problem, if you change it from what's the probability that Linda is a feminist bank teller to how many of 100 women like Linda are, are feminist bank tellers. Likewise, if you have people imagine the, the 100 women, they become suddenly much more rational. So that's why I'm unwilling to say that people are oblivious to probability. Much depends on whether it's the problems are presented to them in a, a more of a mind-friendly format, one in which you can visualize the individual cases. Do you think there's a kind of evolutionary advantage in some sense to um, uh, base rate neglect that, you know, I, I forgot a word today, now I think I've got Alzheimer's and I get very paranoid. So, uh, like, hypochondria actually is helpful because um, every time I'm wrong, it doesn't really matter. But if I get it right once out of 100, actually I might save myself. Um, so do you I, think I, wouldn't put it, I wouldn't put it that way, although that, that is a, a, a profound um, uh, cognitive challenge that I deal with in another chapter in the book under the rubric of signal detection theory, which is just the way I learned it as a psychologist, but it's really equivalent to statistical decision theory. And that is, and, and that d would not require disabling a source of information that is relevant, like base rates, but rather it's, it separates out the legitimate degree of confidence that you are seeing a signal of something in the world with the costs and benefits of being wrong in each way. The two ways of being wrong are the false alarm and the miss. Or uh, just to change the context, just to uh, kind of identify the abstract nature of the problem, because it's not about medical diagnosis per se. But you're sitting at a radar screen, and uh, during the height of the Cold War, and there's uh, a couple of blips. You're, you're up in the distant early warning line in the Canadian Arctic, and you have to uh, inform the, uh, the, the, the Pentagon and the President as to whether uh, we're under attack from Soviet ICBMs, uh, possibly triggering World War III. <clears throat> and there's some blips on the screen. Are they ICBMs or are they seagulls? Now, you, you could optimally calculate, given the sensitivity of the radar and the prevalence of seagulls and so on, and you'd be best off if you did optimally calculate it, not throw base rates out the window, correctly factor them in, but even with the best information, now you, you still have a dilemma, namely, as long as I'm not 100% certain, I can make two kinds of errors. I could you know, tell the president to launch our ICBMs in response to a flock of seagulls, that would be pretty bad, or we could just sit, sit around enjoying ourselves as you know, nukes rain, rain, rain down on, on New York and Washington, and that would also be bad. Uh, now, that's an extreme case but it just illustrates that the optimal decision depends not just on your assessment of probability, on what you know, but on your values. Namely, what price do you put on uh, a, um, being correct in either of two ways, namely a hit or a um, correct rejection, and being wrong in two ways, namely a miss and a false alarm. Now, of course, that's also relevant in the medical case, uh, as you note, know, namely there are costs both to false alarms, namely, do you, you have disfiguring surgery for what might be a harmless cyst, uh, or might you miss a tiny little uh, speck that might grow into a fatal cancer? They both have costs. Signal detection theory, or statistical decision theory, is a way not of forcing yourself to be a bad statistician in the sense of throwing base rates out the window and coming to the wrong answer, but rather taking two ingredients, namely your best assessment of the probability, which is a mathematical problem, and your values in terms of how much would it suck if you were wrong in each of the two directions. And it's a, it's a kind of branch of, of, of mathematics that tells you where you should assign the cutoff. And it's relevant in, in many other domains of human judgment, such as the courtroom. Uh, evidence is never perfect, so did the person, did, did, did the, um, uh, accused commit the crime, there are two ways to be wrong. You could have a false conviction, send an innocent person to jail. You could have a false acquittal, let a guilty person walk free. Uh, and depending on the uh, strength of the evidence and depending on the quality of your forensics, namely how often does a, uh, a bit of evidence really come from a guilty 
perpetrator as opposed to someone who's innocent? How often do you mismatch fingerprints? How often do you uh, screw up DNA samples? How often do the, the bite marks or the bullet marks uh, actually not come from the gun that you think it is? That determines how bad the problem is. But however bad or good the forensics are, you always have the decision, which is in part a value decision, of how unjust would it be to let a guilty person go free, how unjust it would be to falsely convict an innocent. And we have the traditional Blackstone ratio from the 18th century jurist, better 10 guilty people go free than one innocent be convicted. Now, of course, that itself is not a mathematical result. That's uh, you know, it's somewhat arbitrary, but perhaps justifiable stipulation of the, the values, the costs, but the, that chapter on signal detection theory is just a way of clarifying how we ought to think about problems like that. Namely, we ought to get our best estimate of the probability, but we also ought to know what our values are. And it's only the combination that, uh, that allows us to come to the decision that will satisfy our own values. Namely, if we really don't want to convict a lot of innocent people, where should we set the cutoff? People, I, I, and I, the reason that I included that chapter is that people, I think, are often a little fuzzy about the, 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 the distinction. They don't realize that the, this trade-off is inevitable. So you often have calls for, um, well, let's, let's uh, get tough on crime. Let's uh, keep criminals off the streets. Let's monitor for terrorists before they can attack. Let's uh, believe the accuser uh, so that more wrongdoers are caught and punished. Now, that may be a good thing, but it's absolutely equivalent to saying, let's also punish a lot of innocent people. Uh, because you can set, the, if, you, if all you're doing is lowering the cutoff, uh, you will nab more guilty people. There'll be fewer uh, false negatives. But inevitably, there will be fewer false positives. And again, the mathematics can't tell you which is worse. That is a matter of our values. But we can try to make decisions that at least implement our values. And it also highlights the fact that, this, I mean, this is kind of a tragic dilemma. Are we condemned to throwing innocent people in, in, in prison or letting heinous criminals walk free? Well, what it does tell us is that there is a way to mitigate the, tra the tragedy. Namely, the more precise your methods are, the less likely you confuse signal and noise. Technically, the less the overlap between the signal distribution and the noise distribution, two kind of bell curves, the fewer miscarriages of justice in either direction you'll be making. And so if you want a better court system, it shouldn't be, let's try to throw more people in jail. It should be, let's improve our forensics. And likewise in the medical context, and likewise in the, uh, the, the, the radar screen operator context, the, uh, we're stuck with the tragedy, but we can mitigate it with more sensitive detection methods. I think the chapter that where you talk about, you know, what, what's wrong with people, why do people actually uh, believe these kind of crazy things? Uh, as you say, it was the chapter that everyone wanted to read. Yes. Uh, um, and, and I think it is, for those that, you know, understand all of the ways of rational thinking, it is sometimes, you know, well, why, how, why is it that still with all of this equipment that we've gathered over you know, thousands of years of intellectual investigation, we're still believing crazy things. And you know, you have a wonderful index of fallacies at the back. It goes on and on, the different bad ways of thinking. But you, but you, you kind of suggest it's not really that, and it's not social media. Um, but you talk about this thing, my side bias. Um, could you tell us a little bit about that? Because it seems incredibly relevant to understanding why people just hold on to to beliefs that seem to be irrational. Uh, indeed, and the my side bias, almost self-explanatory, namely you uh, endorse the beliefs, you, you believe the propositions that are you know, sacred values or battle cries or, or loyalty oaths to your side. Your side in a competition, say, between political factions or, or sports teams, and we tend to believe those, uh, those uh, ideas that make our side look good. Now, doing so is, in, in one sense, is not completely irrational. Rationality always has to be defined relative to a goal. It's a means of attaining a goal. And if the goal is respect and prestige within your clique, not being ostracized, uh, but rather being kind of a hero, 
then it can be rational to endorse the beliefs that your side uh, clings to. And some of the uh, resistance to vaccines, some of the endorsement of conspiracy theories, well, if they make the liberals look bad and they make our you know, the, the uh, conservatives look good, people will cling to it, and, and vice versa for beliefs that seem to ratify the values of, of the left and demonize the right. Keith Stanovich, a very influential psychologist of reasoning, has a, a, a new book called the, the Bias That Divides Us, in which he, it's almost a, 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 a meta study of a com comparison of all, all you, you cited my um, appendix of list of cognitive biases. You may say, well, which is the worst? Or at least which is the most pervasive? And Stanovich argues that the my side bias might be the most robust, the most powerful. It's one that is not uh, negatively correlated with intelligence, so smart people are just as susceptible. Uh, it is um, probably equally distributed uh, among people on the right and people on the left, although each side denies it because of the bias bias, namely everyone thinks the other side's biased, but they aren't. And it might explain a lot of the, uh, the irrationality as a, a kind of um, perverse rationality for a different goal, namely prestige and solidarity within the community. And it leads to another concept that I, I think should be in everyone's kind of mental toolkit and which gets a chapter in the book, and that is the game theoretic idea of the tragedy of the commons or the prisoner's dilemma when it involves two, two people. And this is the game theory is the uh, study of what is the optimal decision or move when the outcome depends on other rational agents' uh, choices as to what their optimal move is. And the, uh, the, the, the finding that everyone should really grasp is that it is completely possible for several people to do what's rationally in their own self-interest and for everyone to end up uh, worse off. Uh, that can happen in a prisoner's dilemma, that can happen in failures of cooperation that would benefit everyone. Uh, it was act, uh, one of the major themes of, of uh, Richard's the, the selfish gene, uh, namely, what are the, has evolution developed workarounds for prisoners' dilemmas in which you uh, really would be better off not doing what's in your interest at that moment. There, there is a kind of solution that may have evolved in, in uh, reciprocal altruism. Um, but in the, going back to our weird beliefs, why do people believe in conspiracy theories and um, uh, the vaccine refusal uh, when it aligns with a particular coalition, the tragedy there is that everyone doing what's rational in the sense of earning um, credence, street cred, uh, honor, glory within your coalition can make everyone worse off because it doesn't incentivize people to find the truth. Uh, you know, what, uh, what earns you status within a coalition and what's true are two different things. And it can be rational to pursue one um, and irrational if you don't pursue the other. And that sets the stage for one of the, an answer to another frequently asked question is like, what do we do about it? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Uh, about this, this, ex uh, this yeah, explosion. How do we use the tools that you've developed in the book to, to yeah. counter somebody who's saying, well, I'm anti-vax? I mean, well, what do you do when, when, when you meet somebody like that? I mean, what are your tools? Yes, well, for some, uh, for some people, they'll, they'll go to their grave believing it. Uh, you, you, can't, you probably cannot persuade everyone. But with many convictions, there's a, a continuum of, de of degree of belief, and the people who are kind of more at the fringe, they you know they know some people who believe it, they kind of like those people, but they may know some other people who believe the opposite. Uh, you can peel off the people at the periphery of the belief continuum. And, um, you know, new babies are being born all the time and they don't, they, they don't, uh, aren't innately uh, susceptible to the QAnon conspiracy theory and you can give them reasons not to get sucked in in the first place. So I do believe that there is a role for persuasion even though we do know that there are people who are impervious to, persu to persuasion, who just dig in their heels even deeper, think all the harder of how to refute the arguments for something that they don't want to believe. It's a, one of the ways in which we humans in, are often more intuitive lawyers than intuitive scientists. Namely, we are more interested in 
ammunition, rhetorical ammunition that allows our side to prevail than in the, uh, an objective truth that applies to, to all of us. And uh, again, that's part of the explanation for why there is so much apparent irrationality. And the solution, one part of the solution would be in, to have everyone go to probability school or make critical thinking probability part of the curriculum. But I think it's only part of the answer. Daniel Kahneman himself is famously pessimistic about the ability of educational curricula to de-bias people. And indeed, it can be, uh, you are pushing against resistance because you're fighting uh, intuitions that are deeply rooted. I don't think it's impossible because it can be done when problems are reframed. But in a way, it is partly missing the point that because a lot of irrationality comes about because of this game theoretic dilemma of everyone doing what earns them, uh, what's good for their reputation to the detriment of everyone, if that's all that anyone is doing, you have to change the rules of the game. You have to change the instruct, in, incentive structure so that it's no longer a, a prisoner's dilemma, a tragedy of the commons. And in the case of rationality and knowledge, we do that by joining communities that agree to work by certain rules that do incentivize objectivity and truth, despite the temptation to strive for a different commodity, namely ego, prestige, being right. And those communities are things like science, when it works well, and that's why we have peer review, that's why we have, uh, at least we ought to have, we claim to have, we should have uh, uh, academic freedom, where you can broach an idea, and it can be attacked, but not you, the idea. Uh, in liberal democracy, we have freedom of speech, we have parliaments, we have uh, open debate. In, um, uh, in, in journalism, we've got editing and fact-checking. All of them are kind of regimes of rules that push back against everyone's tendency to just want to be right, to want to be the expert, to want their own truth to prevail, and instead incentivize the, the truth prevailing. So no matter how much you are wedded to your theory, you want it to be right, it's, you know, it's my theory of the brontosaurus, uh, you, uh, if you are a practicing scientist, other people can shoot it down, you know, if they have good arguments, if they have counter evidence, and it's that collectivity that can, that makes us rational as a species, not the individual person. And unfortunately, when these communities of rationality are disabled or, or hamstrung, when you've got, uh, uh, and, and you could claim that social media kind of do that because it empowers everyone to be an expert. There isn't an editor that vets what you say. There isn't a, a fact checker. Uh, when you have abrogations of freedom of inquiry within the university, so certain ideas are taboo or unsayable, then you are disabling the mechanism that allows us to pursue truth and it reverts more to who's got the louder voice, who's more popular, which beliefs are more chic, and, and so on. Uh, the, there was some research in uh, Nature uh, over the last couple of years that uh, somehow the only way to disrupt somebody's story that they've got in their head is to, to tell another story, that you know, as much data as you give them. But that's, for me, terribly unscientific, you know, to come with just one example of somebody who died from measles or something compared to all of the data. But, um, but do, do you think with such natural storytellers that in some way you, you, you need to be a little bit unscientific to try and to disrupt somebody else's story? Yeah, it is a, it is a, a profound question. That is, given that it is unavoidable that we are affected by images and anecdotes and they kind of uh, sink in more deeply than, than the statistical reality, are you entitled to use the salient anecdote that happens to be aligned with the statistical reality at least as a, I don't want to call it propaganda or, you know, agitprop, but maybe as a little nudge in the right direction. So, I mean, an example is uh, people probably don't appreciate climate change as much as they ought to, at least in terms of, of being um, motivated to act or to pressure politicians into acting. Uh, in journalism, could you present a hurricane, a particular hurricane, as an example of cli climate change is already here, all the more reason to act now or in an emergency, 
when you can't really pinpoint any single hurricane as being caused by uh, uh, global warming because there's always a distribution of hurricanes. We don't know for sure that this is an extreme one that would have happened anyway. But given that the awfulness of the image of the people being inundated and, and you know, cars being submerged, you can't get that out of your head. And it's kind of on the side of the angels. Namely, it's a good thing if people perhaps illicitly treat it as an example of climate change. You know, is that an okay thing to do? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I don't know the answer, but I, I probably you know, my, my conscience as someone who you know, really does believe in the truth is a good thing, that we shouldn't, it shouldn't be just my propaganda against your propaganda, that if the image is accompanied by the best possible argument, uh, just saying this is an example of something, don't believe it because of the image, here is the image, you should believe it because this is the evidence, that's probably the, the, the best combination. And in a way, I think it's why your book is so uh, successful, because you combine uh, just you know, giving everyone the, the theory, the ways to think, but, but it's also full of humor and, and very good jokes and things, which help to just humanize uh, you know, what sometimes is, you know, uh, some people think might be a dry, you know, I, do I have to do this probability argument to, um, but uh, uh, so you see, I think you use that very well in the book. And it's very oh, successful. Yeah, I think we should open it up. Um, I, I've been hogging the uh, conversation here. So we've got a couple of mics uh, that are roaming. There are people online, hopefully you have some questions. So uh, we have a question here. I see a hand going up. So if you could get the mic to, um, if you keep your hand up so they can see the mic coming. Uh